I really love the theme of this conference, Empowering Connections, because it reminds me of how powerful vulnerability is. Vulnerability is at the root of how we connect with each other and the world around, around us. us. We can't have a true level of connection with someone without a certain level of vulnerability. But on the other hand, trauma can disconnect us. April is nationally known as Child Abuse Prevention Month. It's estimated that five children die every day in the United States due to abuse and neglect. And in honor of the Child Help Awareness Campaign, I have painted five of my fingers purple as a visual reminder for the five children that die every day in the United States due to abuse and neglect. Every single second of every single minute of your day matters. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Because in one second, your life can change. I know mine did. And let's be honest, child sexual abuse is not fun for anyone to talk about or hear about. But we have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. We have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable because it's the only way we're going to see true progress with this issue and with other issues in our nation. Although it's not comfortable, we have to face it because denial around this issue, which is what I find a lot in this field, is not helping our children. And as a survivor, I know that I'm not alone in this room. It's estimated that one in three girls are sexually abused before the age of 18. And I am one of three daughters. It's also estimated that one in six boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. There are 42 million survivors of child sexual abuse in America alone. Let's wrap our minds around that number, 42 million. And to give you a comparison, this is about three times more prevalent than the amount of Americans living with cancer. And we all know someone living with cancer. The difference is there's generally more public support with cancer. And as soon as it's diagnosed, it's generally treated. With this issue, child sexual abuse, I hear a lot of people say, this doesn't happen in my community, this doesn't happen in my school, this doesn't happen in my church. And I always say, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. But the American Medical Association has labeled child sexual abuse a silent epidemic. And I believe this is because it is truly the silence that kills. It's estimated that two-thirds of children will never tell. Two-thirds of children. And I believe this is because over 90% of the time, a child is abused by someone that they know, but not just someone that they know, someone that they also trust. See, perpetrators use this pre-existing relationship as a deposit for the child's silence. It's much easier for a child to tell on a stranger than it is a family member or a loved one. But in silence, shame is allowed to grow. And what's kept in secret has power over us. That's why we cannot heal what we don't reveal on an individual level and as a society. Because silence and shame are a predator's weapon of choice. We have to refuse not to keep the secret in our society. And this is not a crime that just happens to at-risk children. I was not an at-risk child growing up. I was quite the opposite. I was a teacher's kid. And any teacher's kids in here know that there's not much you can get away with. The spotlight is always on you. 
And when I was in the second grade, my mom told me that she had accepted a teaching position at a private Christian school. And she took my two sisters and I with her. And it's at this private Christian school where my older sister and I met our best friends. And they were in the same extracurricular activities as we were. And our best friends also happened to be siblings. And their mom also worked at the school with my mom. So it was very convenient to be around this family. And basketball was my sport of choice, my love. And they played basketball as well. But not only that, they lived in the neighborhood right near us. So there was a lot of carpooling going on. Just think of your closest family friends, who you do life with. And this is who this family was for us. But little did I know that someone who was like a father to me, my best friend's father, and someone who also played the role of a basketball coach in my life, would sexually abuse me for years. And he started grooming me at the age of 12. And for those of you who don't know what grooming is, grooming is when a perpetrator goes out of their way to gain trust and access to the child. And families are groomed as well. Families are groomed so that they will trust the perpetrator to be alone with their child. And after that first incident in the car of sexual assault, when he drove me home one night, I knew I would never be the same. Feelings I had never felt before. Intense shame, blame, fear, and guilt. And no amount of showering could get that dirty, clammy feeling off of me. And I was threatened not to tell, like most children are. And I minimized the event, and I told myself that it would never happen again. But I was wrong. It continued for years. How could I tell my best friend that their father was a monster? How could I tell his sweet wife, who worked at the school, how could I tell her who her husband really was? So as the burden of keeping the secret in Suffering and silence continued. I developed severe changes in behavior. I went from being outgoing to socially withdrawn and depressed. I went from making good grades to failing. I had horrible insomnia and awful night terrors. I would wake up in the middle of the night, halfway down the stair landing, with my hand on the stair railing, heart beating out of my chest, not knowing how I got there. And it would take me hours to get my heart rate down after a night terror. But not just that, I also began cutting. Cutting is very common in victims of sexual abuse. And for those of you who don't understand cutting, it is directly related to control. Because at least I could control the pain. At least I could control the bleeding. But worst of all, I lost hope. I lost hope that I could get out of my situation, that it could get any better, that I could tell. And the number one predictor of suicide is loss of hope. But I imagined a scenario in my head where if I were successful in taking my own life, he would be at the funeral. And he would attend to my parents' needs. And he would ask if there's anything he can do to help. And no one would have ever known. Some people t take the secret of being sexually abused to the grave with them. But not only that, I started to believe the lies that shame whispered to my soul. I started to believe over time that maybe I did something to bring this on. Maybe this was my fault. Maybe I was a bad person. Maybe, maybe I wasn't worth protecting. And many children believe these lies that shame whispers to their soul after sexual abuse. Twice I even went to the emergency room because I broke out in hives all over my body after two separate instances of sexual assault. And the doctors, they tested me for all kinds of allergies. But I wasn't allergic to anything, and so they said, she must be stressed. She must be a stressed out little girl. After that, my parents were really worried and took me to different doctors to try to find a physiological reason for what was wrong. 
They tested my thyroid. They tested me for anemia. But I was healthy otherwise. And no parent wants to consider that their child's being sexually abused. No educator wants to think that a student in their classroom is being sexually abused. The adults around me were never educated on what those simple warning signs and symptoms are. Finally, when I was 16 years old, we did what we always did for the holidays. We spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with the perpetrator's family. And the day after Christmas, my sister asked me to go to lunch. And I was so excited, because I've always been close with my sisters. And as we're talking over lunch, she looks at me and she gets real serious and she says, Jenna, I'm going to ask you a question and you have to promise to tell me the truth. And of course, in my head, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, she knows I borrowed her brand new shirt and I didn't put it back in the right spot. I'm dead. That's it. I'm dead. Anybody's, anybody with sisters knows that it's an ongoing battle and it still is today. It, it, never, it never fails, the whole borrowing clothes argument without asking for permission. And this is what I'm thinking in my head. I say, okay, what could be that bad? Okay, I promise. I promise to tell you the truth. She looked at me and she said, has anyone ever hurt you? And without saying a word, I gave her the answer. I broke down into uncontrollable tears right there at the restaurant. The server avoided us several times. <laughs> it was a big scene. And when I was able to catch my breath, I said, yes, but I can't tell you who because you know this person and you wouldn't believe me. And she said, try me. She said, we're not leaving here until you tell me because he's never going to hurt you again. And I told her, and the important thing is that she believed me. She believed me. And that night, we called, we called the police after, after I told my family. And of course, there's no words for how my family felt. They had gone out of their way to make sure these exact things didn't happen in our life. After we called 911, I made the report. My parents took me to a psychiatrist who officially diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress disorder, insomnia, anxiety, suicidal ideation. And it was two steps forward and seven steps backward in therapy. But thank goodness my parents found our local Children's Advocacy Center. The Children's Advocacy Center is a free national resource for children and families who have been victims of abuse. And at our local Children's Advocacy Center, I didn't feel alone. I didn't feel like I was the only one going through what I was going through. I could see that there were other kids that had been hurt the same way I had. And I felt a sense of community and support. I received free one-on-one -on -one counseling, free group counseling. And when we decided to press charges, they helped prepare me for court. And the whole trial process was very arduous. I was on the witness stand for three and a half hours. Three and a half hours. But thank goodness, thank goodness the jury gave my perpetrator 70 years in prison, and he has to serve at least 20 of those years. Although I never received an apology, I forgave so that it no longer had power over me. And by the grace of God, I was able to embrace the healing process and face the trauma I cannot stress enough the importance of counseling if you've been a victim of this crime. I was able to trust other people instead of hiding from people. I was, I was able to trust sources of help instead of running or hiding from sources of help. And slowly my walls started to come down. But I'm not just telling you personally that there's hope in healing. 
and that this crime is preventable. But the research tells us that this crime is preventable. That is the good news. The Center for Disease Control has said that this is a public health problem, but that the key is in prevention. That's our solution. Our solution is in prevention. I'll give you an example of when this realization first set in. After I made my outcry, I had to get a SANE exam, sexual assault nurse examination. And as I was at that hospital, my mom waited in the hospital waiting room. And to pass the time, she picked up a pamphlet that read signs and symptoms of child sexual abuse. And as she's reading it, she gets out a pen from her purse and she starts to mark off over 80% of those signs and symptoms that I had displayed through the course of the last few years. And she was appalled because as an educator, for 20 years, she'd never seen such material. I was summed up in one page of bullet points. If only she saw this pamphlet, she could have prevented this from happening, or at least stopped it from happening for as long as it did. That pamphlet looked very similar to this. And this is the Child Help Speak Up, Be Safe curriculum. It's one of the best curriculums I've seen for students. And out of her experience as an educator of never knowing what those simple warning signs are, and out of my own experience, out of never having the chance to tell in school, never knowing that it was okay to tell, the idea for Jenna's Law was born. And Jenna's Law bears my name and it passed first in Texas in 2009. And it mandates that all schools through 12th grade have to train their school staff, educators, and students on how to recognize, prevent, and especially report this crime. Now, since 2009, over half the country has adopted some form of legislation for their schools. We know that after Jenna's Law training, educators are about four times more likely to report versus their pre-training careers. When we don't address this issue, we feed the deadly silence that this crime thrives on, thrives on. And when children and adults are educated about the crime, taught safety strategies, who is safe to tell, and how to report, a victimized child is more likely to get the help that they need. I really want to encourage you to look into your community, your school, your churches, and find out what prevention policies are in place, what prevention programs are in place to protect children. You know, we have a lot in place for prevention on texting and driving, and drinking and driving. So why wouldn't we have prevention for a crime that is this prevalent? If you leave here with one thing today, I want you to know that there is hope. We live in the most hopeful day and age, where we have access to online resources, prevention programs, counseling, and support. I want you to know that this crime is preventable. 95% of child sexual abuse is preventable through proper education. That's the good news. That's the good news. And if this is something that you have been through, despite what anybody says, I want you to know that there is healing after child sexual abuse. And if you haven't started that process yet, I hope that you will start today and refuse to keep the secret. Thank you.